first of all, have given you an opportunity to purchase these books that we purchased. Uh, it's the, uh, we're not here to read the book, but this is a good book. It'll be a, a useful tool. We'll be touching on that tonight and on the days to come. If you don't have that, I would encourage you to get it, and it'd be fun to go through it. I still look at mine. I use it in our marriage counseling. Uh, in, uh, in Hebrews chapter 13, I wanted to start with this scripture as a basis for what we're going to share, and um, then pull away and, and look at a little video. Thank you, Desiree, for sharing it uh, with me, and uh, I'd like to use that and kind of get out of the way and let uh, this minister share a couple of things, and we'll come back, and I've got some things to share tonight. All right. Hebrews 13 talks about moral directions. Hebrews 13, verses 4, 5, and 6, I'm going to read out of the New King James. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. Very good. I wanted to point out in Hebrews chapter 13, and I, I share this especially with people when I'm marrying a, a couple that's not a believer yet. And it's always my heart that I bring the Lord to them. And I've, I've won a good number of people to the Lord. I've performed or officiated a lot of marriages since I was 19 years old when I began uh, with my first ordination in the ministry. That was in 1979. And so um, just started working and, and learning things. But I've learned that marriage is, is not a Christian thing. It's a human thing. And so I wanted to point out in Hebrews 13, the scripture says that marriage is honorable in all. That's God's plan. And uh, it's good to know God's plan, but that's not the end of God's goal for us, not just knowing his plan, but I think you'd all agree. What God really wants us to do is not only know his plan, but fulfill his plan. So if God said that marriage is honorable and all, let me just throw a rhetorical question out there. That, then every marriage, since God designed marriage, every marriage is going to be great and work out, right? Mm. 40, 43 to 52% don't work out. So we're here tonight, and tonight my subtitle is The Basis of Marriage is a Covenant Marriage. I want to talk about that, and my basis, what I bring to the table and, and I partake of along with you is the scriptural uh, concepts of that, and I'm privileged to share a few of those. But it, Before we do that, I wanted to look at uh, ministers. Uh, if it's ever been any more succinct than this, I haven't heard of it, and this it just says it's just about everything so get, get your notes ready if you want to record this or take a look. Maybe you've seen it already. Um, how many of you ever heard of Creflo Dollar? He, he's a brilliant-minded uh, minister. I'm glad he's saved, and uh, I wanted to come behind his blessing tonight. Let's take a look at it. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Oh my, I'll tell you one thing, that takes guts in it, it takes an anointing, and it, it takes the Holy Spirit to grease that, or to oil that. I'm glad that uh, we could laugh through that. Um, I would ask you to ask uh, Desiree to send you that link, because I'd like for you to watch that maybe once a week while we're doing this, especially if you're not married, or you're contemplating it. Because you have your future in your hands. And I'm here to help you, but I am uh, covenanting with you. Right here, I would like for us to come under the blessing of God's Word. And if you have questions, please write them down. If you've got one of those books, or I have, uh, in fact, if I get, a, uh, I have some, some of these workbooks left here. This is the previous printing. It's the same material, but uh, these are women's workbooks, and you can use those or have those. Um, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, getting back to uh, Pastor Creflo Dollar's heart to make sure what you're doing is God's plan for you and it's going to last a lifetime. 
Uh, we're coming under the plan of God when we want to marry. God said, and let us make man in our image, verse 26, chapter 1, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female created he them. So God had a mind for the genders. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and every living thing that creeps upon the face of the earth. Uh, the plan to get married is a good plan. It's God's plan. Let me jump down to Genesis 2. I'd like to always uh, add this to that. And so here's uh, Adam coming under the plan of God and the purpose of God. He's in the garden of paradise for I don't know how long. Bible scholars differ on how long he was in existence till God brought a, a mate to him. But uh, after Adam gave names to the cattle, verse 21 of chapter 2, and the, there was not found an help meet for Adam. That's the only phrase that tells us that there was a longing in Adam's life, okay? Now, God sees that longing. It doesn't even say that Adam voiced it to him. So, I'm glad to be in your midst. I want you to know that God knows what you're, what you're going through. He knows about the longing in your heart. And he has already made provision for that. Here's how it worked for Adam. You know the story, but I want to come back to the beginning so that if you've got some of this uh, Cruffalo Dollar stuff going on in your family, your past, that you can say, okay, God, it's you and me, and uh, we're starting over, and we're going to have a wonderful life story together. And my children and my children's children and so on. So God knew Adam needed a mate. He intended for male and female from the beginning. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. Adam slept, and God took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof. The Hebrew word for rib is actually tzela, and it's a, uh, it's, uh, well, we'll just uh, save that for one of our later messages. It's probably not what you think. But out of this, what God took out of Adam, the Lord God made uh, a woman and brought her to the man, and God said that, to Adam, here she is. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Therefore, God says, Shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. So, number one, God's plan is for us not to be alone, but to have a mate, a soul mate, that will complete us and bless us and, and help us. And then number two, this is to come out of the union of a father and mother so God's plan can procreate or continue in the earth. So moving over to tonight, using those scriptures, I want to point out a couple of things. And then uh, what I'm going to be doing is adding to what you have if you're taking notes or listening, or maybe just I pray that God will speak to you. I have called and communicated with the Advanced Institute of uh, International Counseling and got their permission to use their material. It's a $650 course to take it. And so I, I can't copyright it, but they did give me permission to use it and to share it with you. And they've asked you, God, to bless our study together. So I'm, I'm glad about that. But I want to point out, out of uh, Genesis, that we are made to belong to one another. God made us in his image, and therefore he made us to connect with him. All right, remember, here was his plan. Uh, in my image, God is making man. God is connecting with the Holy Spirit, with the, with the Son, the eternal Logos, the Father, Son, and the Spirit are communicating, and they bring forth creation, man on the sixth day, and then woman afterward. God wants us to leave our family and cleave to our wife. And in doing so, in fulfilling God's word, marriage then is a representation of us being connected to God. So we're connecting to one another. 
So what I want to talk about is the basis of a covenant marriage. And the basis is what is found here in the scriptures. And that's that uh, you understand that as a covenant, I'm not talking about just, you know, your best friend forever, Facebook, you know, what looks cool. I'm talking about God's definition. And that's worth asking God's advice and also getting the parents' advice. God said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife. So the parents are passing off an adult child in order for that child to become united in marriage. It's very important that we understand that. So that brings us back to God's original purpose that we're made to connect. And so I want to talk about if you've ever been in one of my meetings or uh, taken one of my classes in my pre-wed counseling, um, actually this comes out of the, uh, the international counseling of, uh, for marriage and ministerial counseling. There are seven steps to a healthy relationship. And I, I want to touch on some of them so that you can move from through these seven steps. I'll just give them to you. We'll be talking about them throughout this different eight meetings. The first step is the gift of attraction. The second step is a gift of friendship. And then that births a relationship. The fourth step is love defined. You're beginning to get to know someone. Creflo Dollar points that out really good. Uh, you know, this person has a difficult time with you know, complete that sentence. That person is seeing how you react to that. In, in doing so, you're beginning to communicate. And that's called emotional bonding. Tonight I want to talk about why it's important to have an emotional bond before you have a physical bond. Let's, let's take, just, just look at me once. What, what's the physical bond? The physical bond is the consummation of the marriage. In God's plan, that was to happen under parental supervision and blessing on what? On the night of the marriage. Okay? When that happens sooner, sooner than... Yeah, I, I don't want you to miss this. Should we take the little ones out? I am. Okay, thanks. Because this is your time. I want, if you have questions, I want to be available. But this is proven material. And in order to not be in the 52% uh, that just didn't work, I, I might suggest that some of the things we'll talk about will prevent a divorce. And uh, I want divorce-proof marriages, and God promises that. And God allows divorce. We'll talk about that later. Some of you had questions about that, and God understands that. The beautiful thing about this is God wants you to be able to begin again and then go on forever. So you don't have to redo that. But after love is being defined, emotional bonding is taking place is the fifth step. Covenantal or a commitment in marriage is the sixth step. That's where, you know, you're going steady and making wedding plans. By now you probably have a minister and someone's helping you. And then the seventh step is the consummation of the marriage, the physical union. All right, now Colleen, I want you to read those seven steps. Let's get a woman's voice in here. And I'll just mention a couple of reasons why you don't want to go from attraction to sexual intimacy. And then we'll support that throughout our times together. So first God gives, because he is love, the gift of attraction. It comes from heaven above. And then the second one is friendship. And there are four categories, acquaintance, casual, close, intimate, Relationship, four categories, me to me, multiple in a group, no pairing, multiple in a group with pairing, exclusive, one-to-one, -one, you're going steady. Then there's fourthly, love defined. That's when you're actually going steady, you're defining what love is, you're inquiring, do I want to really invest in this person? And then the fifth stage is emotional bonding, which is engagement. And an ongoing process here. Six, commitment, which is marriage. Her value has been established. She feels secure, knows she is loved for who she is. Two individuals uniting to form we. 
and then sexual intimacy. If done properly, this will last a lifetime. I can tell you that that's a true statement in my life. And I'm honored to give praise and glory to Jesus for giving me that, that gift. Marriage is a gift. And so I want to encourage you to ask God for the very best. And so we're here to help you do that. It, and in defining those uh, steps, this counseling course does an excellent job. And psychologists will tell you, uh, marriage counselors will tell you, at a tune of about $120 to $260 an hour, depending upon who you go to, that uh, people are different. And if a person is attracted to someone and follows the physical desire to satisfy that physical drive. That physical drive, I mentioned actually in my sermon on Sunday, you'll get the pleasure and you'll enjoy that pleasure for as long as it lasts, but what comes after that is what we want to talk about. What did not happen is that you did not get to know this person. I, I love, I think maybe we should do that cruffle dollar thing every time we meet together. Because I can hide behind that. That took a brilliant mind to say that like he said. It. God was in every minute of that. You need to have that information. And uh, you want to have that at your ready to know what about this girl? What about this guy? All of that. Those things are developing an emotional bond. Here's what I'll say in my marriage classes. If lust, lust is the attraction. Wow, look at that, look at that girl in the calendar there. Mm. Or the girl, oh, look at that guy, he's got a car, he's got tall, dark, and handsome, nice suit, whatever. You know, lust works in any gender, and it wants to take and have without going through the proper procedure of acquiring. Marriage, on the other hand, is meant to educate you and grow you and get you ready to bring forth a godly seed. The purpose of marriage is defined in the scriptures, Malachi chapter 2, is that God would have a godly seed ongoing in the earth so that God would have human representation because God wants sons. So if we jump from attraction to intimacy, we rob ourselves of the emotional bond. We gratify the lust of the flesh, but in doing so, the Bible is very clear that if lust is pursued, lust brings forth sin, and sin when it's conceived, does anyone remember? Brings forth, David? Yeah, sure. That's not a, oh, God's mad at King David because he took Bathsheba and God really liked Bathsheba. No, this is a human thing. God says, you're my offspring. I want you to live like your heavenly father and be generous in your love but be willing to wait for your gratification. So the scriptures, in summary, teach delayed gratification. In doing so, we're growing in self-control. That's a fruit of the Holy Spirit, okay? Now, at any point when a mistake is made, God can and absolutely does forgive. But you remember in John chapter 8, when the woman had a moral failure and the religious people wanted to stone her, Jesus Display of correction and compassion is huge. He doesn't ridicule or doesn't point the finger. He takes his finger, I think he draws his name in a heart on the sand, and then put an arrow through it and said, I love you, Ponini. Hmm. How do you know my name? Well, God knows everything. He knows what she went through. And he said, I'm not condemning you, but don't do it anymore. Because God doesn't want our life filled with those kind of shameful moments. And certainly, as he said, doesn't want kids coming into that environment. So I just wanted to mention that. Now I want to talk about how you can build an emotional bond. Whatever your state uh, right now, maybe you have someone you're seeing, maybe, maybe you don't, maybe you'd like to get there. I want to be able to let you ask me questions and Colleen, Colleen and I are just normal people. Uh, but we've been going to be married 32 years coming, 33 years this June. And uh, I, I'm, I'm glad to say, and this is a boast in Jesus, I've never known another woman beside her. I came into the Lord, uh, not, not fooling around. 
And then when I found out, and not to say I didn't want to, but God preserved me from that. And, and remember what Jesus said, that a thought in God's highest plan, a thought of lust is the same as an act of lust. But I can tell you in God's hierarchy plan, a thought is way more easier to manage than an act. And don't make any mistake about that, because God wants us to have a, a clean slate to start. But I want to read this, and this will support what we're doing here. The basis of a covenant marriage. In 1997, the legislature of the state of Louisiana passed a covenant marriage act. In 1998, because of the success, the state of Arizona followed the example of the state of Louisiana. This legislation, which was passed into law in these states, was designed to protect and strengthen marriages and families and thereby reduce the tragic consequences that are occurring as the result of broken marriages and scattered families. One of the requirements of this law of a covenant marriage act was that couples receive premarital counseling prior to purchasing a marriage license. Such counseling is wise for any individual before taking a serious step of courtship, engagement, or marriage. And uh, now, marriage, if, if the states in the United States of America are recognizing that, and these are states that want to have a population that's healthy, children that are, are not scattered around and taken care of by the state and caught in divorce skirmishes and all of that, um, the states don't want that. They want stable families because stable families produce stable communities. Stable communities grow healthy cities and people want to move there. And so I, I'm coming under the strength of even state laws when we're talking about what we're talking about. Now, when we're talking about a covenant, I'm not talking about a prenup agreement. I'm not talking about a shack up relationship and Hollywood's filled with them. And, uh, and all of that, we're talking about a covenant. A covenant is not the state of Louisiana or Wisconsin or Arizona. A covenant was God's design, and it's made by God to God, and then God makes covenant with man. And then he says, when you covenant in marriage, you're making a covenant back to God. So we are, we are binding ourselves or bonding ourselves to God to the God who wants us to bond to himself. Now, getting back to our emotional bonding. Why can't I just go out and have the physical thing? Just check it out. I'm going to sample the goods. A lot of people. In fact, I marry people that are living together. I used to not do it. And the Lord said, uh, I'm going to use you, Tim, to help these people. Because the reason they're calling you is they're wondering if they can get back to the Lord. And the answer is yes. So, but if a person isn't in, in that uh, season of experience, I don't want them to go there. But I want you to know that a covenant by God or, or a covenant in a marriage is designed to re reflect unchanging and unconditional love that you are going to learn to have for each other. And the way that you learn it is by emotional bonding, not the physical bonding. The emotional bonding occurs when, just like what he's saying, when you see how, let's just use uh, Adam and Eve. I'm not talking about anyone, I'm talking about everyone. How's Adam going to respond when he's angry? How's Eve going to respond when she's angry? What are you witnessing in anger? Questions, answers. What are you witnessing? Are you witnessing a physical act or are you witnessing an emote? Something emoting out of the spirit, out of the soul. You're witnessing an emotion. an emotion. That's good. That's why, you know, the guy hooking up at the bar after a couple of drinks and bought her some and slipped the thing in the drink and they got the date rape thing going, he's getting what he wants, but he's not getting an emotional uh, education. He knows nothing about that girl other than she's feminine in gender. And she's either submitting or not. Okay? God wants us, as representatives of him and the earth, to be emotionally stable and growing. So when we witness emotions, good or bad, we're learning to bond. 
Here, let me give you a couple of statements. We are made to connect to God. God wants man connected to him. We call that salvation. God wants man, true or false, lonely, isolated, and enjoying his race car, his hobby, his job, his whatever, all the rest of his life. True or false? False. False. What does God want man to do? Protect, provide, and honor a woman. We call that marriage. So God made man to connect to woman. Even the physical anatomy shows us that. The reason God cursed homosexuality is because it's, it's uh, contrary to the nature of his creation. There's no future in it. There's no emotional bonding. Everything is contrary to God's plan. And so it can only live one generation. Then it'll die. And it needs to die. Okay? So there's man to woman, man to God. But here, now I want you to watch this because here's where I want to teach you how to start bonding emotionally. We are made uh, in Ephesians chapter 6. Are you ready on that, Colleen? I am. Okay. Ephesians chapter 6. I want Colleen to do some reading. She'll pull a couple things out of the book you have. But God has made us to want to be married. And so we're going to go through that. You know, there's 6.3 billion people on the planet. 53% are female. So if you're a guy, you've got 3.2 billion girls to work through. Surely there's one you can find that you're going to begin to emotionally bond to and say, I do. Okay? That's the same for the girl. But getting the, beyond the, you know, the, the bliss of marriage... God has a higher purpose for marriage. The way that the man learns to emotionally bond to, positively and negatively to his wife, is a reflection of the way God bonds to humankind. We call that the church. Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verse, or, or start in 525, I think it is coming. Okay. For this? Yes. So in Ephesians 5, 25, it talks about Christ and the church and mm -hmm. marriage, as marriage reflects that. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he may sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Would you like me to go on in that section? I just want to point out, and then you can do Hebrews chapter uh, 6, uh, excuse me, Ephesians 6, 1, and mm -hmm. when did I have 34? Ephesians 6, 1 to 3, and then Exodus. Okay, we'll save it that. So, the scripture is telling us that marriage is a picture of how Jesus relates to the church. So that means that it's going to be necessary for us to forgive, to understand, to talk through things, all right? So, that's emotional bonding. Now, if that's true... And I, I want to be able to reason it back or use logic. Uh, remember, Christianity or biblical uh, teaching is always in favor of logic. It's not against logic. You know, understanding and knowledge is sourced in God. So now watch how this works. If there's emotional bonding necessary in a marriage, then there probably should have been emotional bonding necessary with Jesus. And there was. There's two ways that uh, we can emotionally bond. Number one is with honor. Honor in the Hebrew is to emote love, affirmation, and approval. Let's go back to the seven steps. Don't read all the steps. Just, to, I mean, the definition. Just, uh, just numbers. Yeah, real fast. All right, first is friendship. No, it's not. It's attraction. Gift of attraction. Friendship, relationship, love defined. Okay, you guys in trouble. Emotional bonding, commitment to marriage, in marriage, sexual intimacy. Okay, so let's talk about if Jesus needed emotional bonding. He did. How can I, if I'm attracted to someone then how can I get to know them? I'll tell you how. Here's the biblical way. Begin to honor them. What do you honor? Should you honor things that are dishonorable? Of course not. That would be a disillusionment. Should you honor something that's honorable? 
Absolutely. How would you do that? When you're just attracted and walking down, I'll, I'll do, I do this, I learn these principles, they work. I, I, I'll say it, it has happened over and over and over. God rewarded me immediately. I'm thinking of right now, a beautiful woman. She's not my wife. She's a business woman. She works for Milwaukee Electric Tool. She's the regional rep. I think I told this story, it's a true story. I was working up building my shed right down the road here and the brand new tool fell off my tool belt, went down and, and hit the concrete floor. Boom, the battery pack broke up. Oh no, this is a hundred dollar battery, it's brand new. So I'm gonna take it back. I took it back there and it, they had a promotional tool going and I'm just standing in line and I, I told the guy what happened. I said, yeah, I dropped it off the ladder. He said, hmm. Yeah, they're not made, made to fall that far. There's a $99. I said, he said, well, you know what? The rep's here today. She's actually here repping some new tools. Hey, why don't you go tell her? So I'm just standing in line. I'm just smiling. She comes walking by. I said, I really appreciate your new tools. They really work well. She said, oh, yeah, tell me about it. I said, well, I bought this toolkit. And I was actually up on the ladder and it's working so good, I don't need extension cords, it's safe. Except when I was crawling through the rafters, the tool belt hooked and it, it came it off and it bounced off the ladder, hit the ground, and I broke the battery pack. She said, hmm, that's not so good, is it? I said, no, it's not. Is there any way you could help me? She's looking at me. She said, if you keep smiling like that, nothing is impossible. I'm gonna go change that battery out for you. I hope you don't drop it anymore. She gave me a brand new battery right there. But what did I do? I honored her company. I honored her person. I honored the product. When you begin to honor with truthfulness, you'll see that what you plant grows and comes back. When you start doing that to people, I've, I've sat with a lot of young people. I said, well, if you're, if you're not ready, uh, step away from this person. You're not sure. Start honoring, get to know a lot of people, or a couple, three, four, five, and, and speak words of honor. You're learning how to honor someone. So honor in the Hebrew is to speak words of goodness that are truthful. Speak words. Now let me give you the next way that you grow. The next way that you grow in emotion is blessing, baruch. And blessing, there's seven ways to bless. And that takes you actually through the realms to sexual intimacy. When a man blesses a, a woman that he's betrothed to, he ultimately gives her the gift of his purity. And the woman surrenders the gift of her fruitfulness. That's the final step of intimacy. So here's what I want to share with you. The way you can start immediately building emotional education in your life is start honoring with your words. Now, let's go back to my statement. Jesus loves us like a man is to love his wife. Did the wife die for, or did Jesus expect the church to die for him or did he die for the church? He died hanging naked on a cross. He paid the price. He's the protector. He's the provider. He's the leader. Men, it's your job to protect, to provide, to lead in honor. Don't wait for her to dial your phone number. You better learn to move through the insecurities, to maneuver through your self, self, I'm lusting, I want, I'm attracted, I want it now. And guys will piss and moan till they get it. Look at Harvey Weinstein. Look at how many young little girls he's taken in the privacy of his chamber. Now it's coming out. And because he prevailed on them, he ultimately won them. Is he the better for it? Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage is honorable in all, and the marriage bed is undefiled, but, what's the next phrase? Fornicators. Whoremongers, say it. Whoremongers. And adulterers. That talks about the man and the woman. They can't wait for their gratification. It says God will judge. Then it says don't be covetousness. Wait your turn. Mm -hmm. It'll be a blessing to you. Now, you can always restart, but don't think you can do your own thing because God is already telling us the Harvey Weinstein moment's coming. The whole world's going to look at you and say, away with it. Okay, let's go back to Jesus. How does Jesus get honored with words? Listen to this. This is huge. There's 
uh, a deprivation neurosis. It's a, a you know a cute anthropological term. Uh, it deals with the syndrome that happens when someone has not been emotionally built up. If you have not had the rite of passage coming through your mother and your father, which is God's way that a family should grow and be strong, the father, especially the father, daughter, and the mother, son, the first exposure you'll probably have to, to nudity is in the home where there's a safe environment where you're not going to be lusting after your dad or your mother. It's, oh, wow, that's what a, a grown figure looks like. So in the safety of that, you can move through the questions in the safety of your mom or dad. Not in the locker room, not in the back of the bus, not at the college dorm. It's as you're growing up. And so when you have mom or dad to relate to, then you can begin to have emotional strength built into you. There's two ways that you get that emotional strength. Number one is through words. The second one is through touch. Okay? That's why in the seven steps to a healthy relationship, touching is not the first one. I tell girls, if you'll let me, I told my daughter, you slap that hand away. If you were those girls with Harvey Weinstein, you got a voice, you better use it. Use your fifth voice, use your belly voice. Don't you touch me! Okay? Now, if you're not crying out, you're enjoying the moment just as much as he is, and lust is moving. Okay? Once that motor is running, it's going to go. So at any time, God can step in and forgive. But I want you to hear this stuff so you could, you could build your own life, and I'm sure you'll build a good one. Jesus needed the honor of words. Watch this. This is huge. I hope you'll never forget this. Here he is. He's grown up in a, in a family. He's one of six kids. He's the oldest. He's special. Special needs. You know, he had to live down, the, you know, the syndrome of all of that. And then he's, he's 18. He's, now he's 30. It's time for him to move through the rite of passage into what God had called him to be. For you, your marriage is an important step. What words did Jesus need from his father to know it was time for him to move forward? Listen, Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. Jesus goes down into the water to be baptized. John baptizes Jesus just like everyone else. He's on a date. He's out there with everyone else. But he's got a special purpose. There is one woman and one man for you that God has sanctioned for you. The genetic blueprint is there. The fingerprint is going to be what is on your children, helping make up. God already has all that plan. Okay? So same with Jesus. But Jesus needed affirmation. He needed emotional building in his life. And this is how it came. He goes down into the water. He comes out of the water. The heavens open. And his father says, This is my beloved daughter, Wendy, in whom I am well pleased. Everyone hears that Tim loves his daughter. And if you're going to mess with Jesus, you're going to mess with the Father. Isn't that good? Mm -hmm. That's emotional bonding. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, Jesus' generation hears, whoa, I can't do the Harvey Weinstein thing here. Me you. Because she might tell her dad. Or Jesus has this link up with, holy cow, I never, some thought it was a thunder. But four gospel writers could interpret Hebrew. Now, that's not the last time he was, an emotion, he was emotionally affir affirmed. He had to be emotionally affirmed in front of one of the greatest battles he was ever going to face. He was on the Mount of Transfiguration. And Moses and Elijah, he's having a supernatural moment. It's like, uh, you know, he, he could have arguably done anything he wanted to in a miracle, but he didn't. He was there. Moses and Elijah were there communicating with him about the form of death he was going to die. It would almost be like you having a private date. You got the permission of the Father. The Father voice 
Okay, I give you permission to get to know my daughter. She's letting you get close. So here we are in a moment. Peter and James and John are there, and all of a sudden they see Moses and Elijah. And Peter says, oh, Lord. You know, it's just like the guy wants to, well, you know, he's, he's stepping in. He's moving close. He wants to, he wants to gratify his, his affections. And she's not sure she should do it. But in order to save the relationship, sometimes she's forced into it. So he, they, they do it and, or they don't. But it's in the same kind of a manner. At this high climax of Jesus' life, it's the, this is what we should do. And all of a sudden, out of heaven, a voice comes and says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. God affirms again and settles the emotions of the apostles. Don't be following Elijah. Don't be following Moses. It's time for you to listen to the new guy. Or, you know, let's take this into the realm of dating. Words are very important. That's why one day you're going to speak vows. Not so much to the person, but you'll speak vows of covenant that go to who? God. He's watching. So I want to encourage you that the basis of a covenant marriage is your vow. It's a covenant between God. It's a covenant, a covenant of affirmation. And in using words all the way up to the marriage ceremony, use words of honor. And then as honor begets a friend, and a friend begets a close friend, and then you start singling out your time, continue to use words of life. And then listen for words of life. Use the scriptures and just speak good things. And you'll be on, uh, on watch just like Jesus was. These guys heard the voice of heaven speak on behalf of Jesus that God was affirming him. That's a good thing. And emotional bonding occurs. Emotional bonding occurs with affirmation. But emotional bonding also occurs with refusal. To affirm means to say yes. To refuse means to say no. Can you think of a moment where Jesus had a refusal of words that were spoken in him? Somebody. Emily's nodding yes. Satan was tempting. Pardon me? Satan was tempting him. Okay, so that's in the realm of the spirit. Very good. Three times. He was tempted in the realm of the body. He was tempted in the realm of the soul. He was tempted in the realm of the spirit. You, when you're dating, you'll be tempted in the realm of the body. You'll be tempted in the realm of the soul. And you'll be tempted in the realm of your spirit. And it's easy to overcome them all by doing what Jesus said to do. I'm thinking of another time where Jesus refused an affirmation. I'll, I'll help you. Yeah. That's Peter, it. Yeah. Go ahead. Behind. Why did he say that? Can you, do you remember? Um, he didn't have any mind with the things of God. Yeah. What did Peter say? He was trying to rebuke him for saying that he yeah. would be yeah, Peter wanted to take matters into his own hands, into his, into his intellect. And our intellects are good, but our intellects are not our spirit. See, what I'm talking to you about tonight is sourced already in your spirit. God li lives there, and he loves you, and you love him there. And if you let him begin to communicate to you out of that realm, these scriptures will begin to be like concrete building blocks, and, and the building can go up quickly. I'm not talking about a 40-year plan to get married. Talking about getting secure in yourself as a man to take the lead. And then I want to read a couple of things. Because I want you to understand that from my perspective, like God affirmed his son, I've affirmed my children. And uh, that's your parent's job to do. If your parent isn't there uh, because they're deceased or maybe they don't know the Lord, maybe they don't understand these principles, God will still send someone to help you. I can help you. My wife can help you. But there's six tests for you to to know, to confirm your true love. The first test is full parental consent. All right, you need the mother and the father to say yes. You know, every guy is attracted to every girl. It's a human thing, but there's one that's made for you. Okay, so the blessing of a father and a mother for a marriage is essential. Just like the blessing of God from heaven was essential for Jesus to know 
that he had the security that heaven's backing what he's going to do. What did he do? He went out to a wedding, and when people had already drank all the wine, which means there were some red noses and red eyes and slurred words, what did God do? Thou shalt not drink wine at a wedding. <laughs> he gave them more wine. That's, that's crazy. I mean, it's crazy fun. That's how much God wants you to have a good marriage. Wants you to have a good wedding. So you want... It's a good time for my next scripture. Okay, go ahead. All right. Ephesians 6 says, because he's talking about honor and uh, blessing. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Children, obey your parents. Thank you for bringing up the parents. Here's how parents interface with the emotional bonding. When children are little, look at these little ones. They, they're special around their mother. They grew for nine months. They know the voice. They know the heartbeat. They know the sense of smell. They know everything. They're bonded there. There's an emotional bond. There's a physical bond. That's for the protection and growth and development of the child. At age 12, for the girl... At age 13 for the boy, the bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah, puberty's coming into play, and that child is now being uh, released into young adulthood. They're going to be overseen, but they're going to be given pr privileges and authority. But watch how touch works. Now, because they're going into that realm, uh, the parent is giving them more latitude and liberty. Up until then, touch was, look at, I saw them tonight, these kids, there it is right there. Totally protected and safe in the arms cradled of mom and dad. There's an emotional touch there. When at age 12, you step back a little bit. Actually, you know, at the process of schooling and all that, you step back. Then all of a sudden, uh, parents are there, but not as much. Um, the reason why Words are so important is because words are always there. Touch is there, and then touch is withdrawn, and then ultimately a parent withdraws his touch, especially in the realm of intimacy, and confers that to the young adult, and that's then reserved for the marriage. But the authority figure is important to realize. If a young man or a young woman has not gotten the emotional bonding and security of touch, there's deprivation neurosis. The thalamus of the brain emits a, a chemical and it, it sends impulses to the neurons that I'm in a safer environment or I'm insecure. I see it all the time with children that haven't been hugged and, and prayed with and whispered in their ear. I, I've learned as a pastor that it's my role to put my hand, not sexually, on both sexes on their shoulder, to let them know, add a boy, add a girl, you look beautiful today. Oh, that dress is becoming on you. Great job what you said. Oh, what am I doing with my words? Okay. Honoring. Honoring. What's happening when they hear? They're feeling good. They're emotionally getting stronger. And then ultimately, what they hear, Pastor Tim, you know where I learned this? Come here, Tim. You did a good job in your sermon today. <laughs> I'm glad that you gave in the offering. I wanted my people to see you give. I wish you would have started that a couple of years ago. <laughs> so guess what I do? I learned from my father and the Lord. So you, you do it with words, and then when emotional strength is there, you do it with touch. The child has that touch. What does it have? It has parental security, okay? And with parental security, the space that is there is always like when we go on vacation. You know, Colleen goes into the ladies' room with the girls. I go into the boys' room. You stand there and you wait and you, you protect. If that has not been part of your life, there's deprivation neurosis. There's parts, remember the honeycomb picture? There's parts of your honeycomb, that's your heart and your soul, that aren't honey yet. But God can fix that, and he wants to, so that we stand up. You know, we are the homo sapiens. We are, we are not the insecure. You know, I, I, my, my name's, I don't, I'm, 
Hi, I'm, I'm Tim Winter. I'm, I'm glad to meet you. Uh, you're the Milwaukee tool rep. You got a great tool, but I got a problem with this tool. It's my fault. You know, I told you the story. So we learn to be emotionally secure in who we are, and that's what you begin to bring to the opposite sex. You want to see if they're emotionally secure, or are you marrying a problem? Are you a rebound for them because they, in lust, got what they always wanted? That was, that was the way that they were brought up. That's human nature. God wants us to live out of the divine nature. So the mother and the father must give consent. They're the authority structures. And those authority figures are allowed in the personal space. Listen to this. Authority figures are allowed in the personal space of the individual. Colleen and I can knock on Wendy's door. She's an adult. She just happens to live here. Or let's use the dorm room. Parents visiting weekend. Knock on the door. Oh, I just want to see where you're living. Wow, okay, very good. You know, Parents, as the authority figures, aren't violating personal space, are they? Of course not. Unless something's out of order. So the parent then confers that personal space to the prospective friend. I give you permission to get closer. But now, because you're in the rite of passage, it's up to you to protect your personal space. If you don't protect that with your life, you're giving one of the most valuable possessions you have away for free. You don't want to do that. So, the personal rights of an individual are given to us by God, and God gives children to parents for parents to train up. Parents are to affirm uh, honor and blessing with touch and words, and ultimately, you carry that into your marriage. Okay? And the father giving the girl permission to get close to a young man, that's God's way. All right? It's in, in the Hebrew culture. Uh, I have writings here. You can study it. The Jews, well, now it's starting to get dispersed. But without argument, they're some of the most wealthiest, family concentric people on the planet. They have followed God's plans. They keep their wealth in the family. God does not want wealth scattered to, in fact, adultery is to pay someone, you know, and, and then divorce, you're paying patrimony. You're paying someone else to sleep with your, it's like insanity. And so forget it, I'm not even getting married. So when I'm done, I just leave. That's not the answer. The answer is to understand God's principles and then to build your life on the foundation of his word. So the father gives permission and the girl brings, brings her emotional growth into the process. She's growing. She's asking Creflo Dollar questions. I'll be referring to that a lot. Some of the questions you want to ask, I'm going to turn it over to Colleen. She's got a couple things to read out of the uh, scripture and then also out of that book. Uh, I think it's page 19 or 20 in there. Mm -hmm. But here's some questions that you'll want to ask. And if a parent isn't involved, then you might want to involve a minister or a trusted friend of, that, of the other individual. The whole thing is, don't do this on your own. If God said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife, that means dad and mom are saying, yeah, you're ready. And there's going to be some serious discussion. We're not talking about foolishness. We're talking about Creflo Dollar real stuff. Okay? And then uh, the daughter has the final word. The classic is that we'll get to us later when we talk more about the marriage and, and moving through these seven steps. But uh, is she ready to say yes and move forward or does she need more time? Any girl that comes to me and says, Pastor, will you help me with this? I'll say, absolutely. Give me a phone number. Let's go talk. I'm, I'm here to protect and grow you. Uh, the woman is the tender gender, the weaker vessel, a man can Harvey Weinstein them and, you know, first time force them before you know it. If she wants a job, she's got to do the thing. And holy cow, we're a messed up country. It's not the way it's supposed to be. Okay? And if Hollywood's your frame of reference, ask Jesus. I'm going to ask Colleen to lead a prayer. Then I'm going to pray. I want to completely, and I'm asking God to retrain my thinking so that I can be a blessing uh, to people that want to live a, a, a healthy and blessed life. You know, a couple of questions. Are you going to be finished with school before marriage? Do your parents, do all parents know all the important facts about you? 
Do you have a firm belief in God? Do you feel you're compatible in faith and life? Do you uh, exemplify a personal faith in Christ Jesus? Do you build your life on the scriptures? These are things that are going to come out, and so it's easy to uh, overlook it because love can be blissfully blind. Do you have agreement on doctrines in the scriptures? We'll talk about equally being yoked. I'll talk about finances. We'll talk about a lot of things that will help you. Are you both active members and understand the purpose of a local church? And here's for the man. A woman needs to see this. Is he ready to become a spiritual leader? Because my daddy is going to give me away or if dad's passed away or, uh, you know, whatever. Someone's going to give her away and say, I'm giving this female to you. Now you cover her. Now you bless her. Now you speak affirmation to her. And then is the woman ready to honor and reverence that man? Because he's going to need honor and he's going to need blessing. Jesus, uh, this just blew, blows me away that Jesus needed to start supernatural work. He needed the Holy Spirit in heaven by the Father say, Stacy is my beloved daughter. I'm well pleased in her. She's ready for what I've called her to do. Or, to, you know, her dad said to me, here's how her dad said it to me. And I went through, <laughs> can, I, can, I, can, I, can I date your daughter? I, why do you want to do that? <laughs> well, I believe I'm in love with her. And I'm, I'm, you know, I've got it all memorized. It's not working. And he said, well, first of all, he just interrupts me just like this. And he's sitting on a little third grade chair that was their kid's chair. And I'm up, up here. He's down there. He said, well, first of all, you don't know what love is, but I understand. He said, love is proven through marriage and sacrifice. But I've been watching you, and uh, I'll give you permission to get to know her. And I'll also uh, tell you not to do anything to my daughter that you can't gracefully back out of. Don't be alone with her. And you know, you know, I've got to go out to for Colleen like pie. I hated pie. She loved pie. <laughs> but I spent more dollars and time at, at uh, crack, not Baker Cracker Barrel. Baker Square. Baker Square with <laughs> French silk pie, right? I still remember. I know, oh, oh sorry, that. sorry, oh sorry. <laughs> <laughs> See what I mean? Never. Okay. Oh, I made so it you through like that. The okay, okay, now okay. you you have a couple of things you want to share. Well, you had this on your list, so I'm just going to get okay. through this. Exodus 22 verse 17 <clears throat> brings some sobriety to what you're finishing there. If her father utterly utterly refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money according to the bride price of virgins. And then I'll just go into 1 Corinthians 7, 1 and 2. Uh, the whole chapter of 1 Corinthians 7 talks about principles of marriage. Uh, now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. And then down in verse 38 it says, So then he, the father, then he who gives her in marriage speaking of his daughter, does well. But he who does not give her in marriage does better. And that's speaking of relationship there. Before you read the, out of that, that book, here's a couple of questions you guys had. What are the appropriate boundaries to keep as a single person? I might quote what Colleen just read. It's not good for a man to touch a woman, nevertheless, to avoid fornication. Let everyone have his own wife and go through the steps of attaining or, or acquiring, you know, getting to know someone. So if you're in a, a marriageable age and the biological clock is ticking, you want to begin to get out of the, I'm afraid, I'm insecure, because you're not. The Christ is in you. You're beautiful. You're valuable. You're worth Jesus dying on the cross for. Get through the beginning processes of presenting yourself. And if someone says, no, or it's not the time, I'm not interested, be okay with that. And then, here's what I did. Uh, that, so that was a good question. Don't, don't try to just bed someone or land someone. You know, whoremongers and adulterers are going to pay an awful, awful price. And I, would, I know that's, that's not sitting in our room here. We all love Jesus. We have a brand new beginning. We wear the robe of righteousness. So all these questions, 
are very important. Here's, a, here's another one. Uh, where was the one I wanted to share? In general. What, what is it about love? What is it about the comment or the commitment? I think I've covered that in the covenant of a base of a of a of a marriage in the scriptures is God's love. If God is love and God is in you, then everything it takes for you to be married forever is in you. And that's what I want to talk to. I want to get that activated in you. And so that's what I would answer to that. And uh, what was commitment about in a relationship was asked a couple of times in Desiree's uh, questions. Um, we'll talk about that. And one, if, if we're here for healing, then we're all here for healing. And so I don't know what you, brought, what you bring to the table or what you've come out of, but you've come from your mother and your father, and you have now the responsibility to keep the good and nurture that, but you have also the responsibility to be honest and say, Lord, I'm bringing this so this doesn't show up downriver for me. I'm building a dam here today, and Jesus is managing this, and he's just going to release me uh, from any soul ties. I've got a number of questions. What's a soul tie? A soul tie is what happens when you build emotional bonds. Hey, I talked to that girl. She gave me a brand new battery. Let's say I was in lust. Let's say I had a, a poor marriage. Well, could, could, I, could I, you know, thank you very much. Liked the way she looked. She talked to me. She liked the way I hit it off first time. She blessed me. I said, oh, I'll come and meet you at the office. Build a bond. And, you know, marriages are broken and, and betrayed all the time in business relationships like that. So there's an emotional bond that's hindering. That's a soul tie. You want to hold your soul in such a way that you guard it and reserve it for the person that is going to take you or go up those seven steps with you and be ready for a, a bond that will be eternal. And now keep in mind that the marriage is not celebrated in heaven. There's no sexual uh, cohabitation in heaven. The reason why God gives us that on the earth is to produce a godly seed. So heaven is completely populated with all the souls that God wants. So it's an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, I want to say, get on with it. On the other hand, I want to say, make sure you're ready. And uh, I would use that book that you have. You, you have those uh, little four things. Colleen's going to talk. I've talked enough. I'm done. <laughs> yeah, get on with it, but... Get it on the right road, that's all. Um, yeah, because the gift of marriage is a beautiful, or the gift of attraction, I should say, is a beautiful thing. And any gift from God should be appreciated and managed well. Um, I, I don't want to get into the book this time yet. Tim shared a really great foundation. I think we had enough. Yeah. Are you sure? Um, and I, my... Uh, couple of thoughts about healthy relationships just healthy relationships period require communication commitment and uh, boundaries and that's friendship that's um, phileo love it, it's any kind of relationship a work relationship and I just want to say one thing about commitment if you can test yourself if you're ready for commitment when you enter a getting serious relationship, you're not ready for commitment unless you're a person that's walking a responsible life in relationship with Jesus, first of all, and then in everything that God has given you. Relationship with your parents, relationships with your work uh, bosses and so forth. If you're not being responsible in your life, and it's not a lot I was a manager uh, and I saw some kids that you never had to tell them twice. And then I saw some kids that they, they didn't know the first thing about being responsible. I had to be their parent. And I took joy in it. But a lot of responsibility starts at the age of one and a half to two when you're able to pick up your toys and your mama picks them up with you. And you just are aware of your surroundings and you take care of them. You should never enter a marriage until you've learned responsibility because a relationship, a healthy one, there are three A's to it. If you're taking notes and then I'll finish with this. 
There is awareness, there is acceptance, and there is appreciation. You need to be aware of that person and their needs, accepting of them, and appreciating to them. In honoring them, which blesses them, builds them up, but blessing them as well, which activates uh, an ongoing loving relationship. And if you do that, you won't have trouble meddling in somebody else's garden if, once you learn how to water your own. But I'll just say that, you know, we can finish with prayer on just allowing the Holy Spirit to come in and shore up our areas of responsibility in our lives oh, that good. maybe our parents never really stuck us to. Or maybe we rebelled and ran away from uh, because God knows how to fill in the blanks. He knows how to give us new lines of thinking and he knows how to reaffirm us like like I love how you said that Father God did that for Jesus, his son. He affirmed him here on the earth. And he never and did anything wrong. No, and supernatural. He was endued with power from on high before he went on. You don't want to enter a marriage without being endued with power from on high. I've said this in our principles class. I know, Greg, you just went through that recently with us. but And Stacy, you too. But... Marriage is a ministry team that God puts together. And he's got Sorry. mighty purposes in that ministry. And if you uh -huh. look at marriage as a ministry match, yeah. you can get through anything because you know your sources from God. Well, God, you put That's us good. together, so help me out here. And that was the first, seriously, and that was the first scripture we read about getting help in Hebrews. Uh, if you didn't write that down, I'll give it to you later, but Hebrews 13, 4, 5, and 6. Uh, but Jesus didn't even want the disciples going out before they were endued with what? Power. 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 From on high. So Danny Silk's got a great book about keeping the love light on. And he talks about powerful people versus powerless people. And powerful people have an amazing marriage. Powerless people drain each other. Because of one thing, they haven't learned to be responsible. They got married thinking, you shall love me all the days of my life. And I shall love you when you love me. Not, I shall love you all the days of my life through thick and thin. It's, the idea is, you shall love me. You shall serve me. No, it's, I shall love you. And I shall serve you all the days of my life. And uh, because... I will take responsibility for my life and how I take care of myself and how I take care of you and my relationship with Jesus and my kids and my parents. When I when my boys are getting ready to get married, I'll just tell you a couple of secrets. I, a couple of my first questions were, and the people they were interested in, and my daughter and loves know this, what is their relationship like with their parents? That was one of the first things I wanted to know. What is their relationship like with their parents? And what is their relationship like with Jesus? And have they had time to just really walk with Jesus alone? Right. I observed that. That was a key indicator to me that they were ready. They've walked with Jesus alone. Alone. They let go. They put their life on the altar for Jesus first. If you're married to Jesus, God will, you will do well with the love that God gives you. It's in so us. I finished with that. Yeah. It's, it's in us. us. Just we'll talk more it. about that special person if you're dealing with that, but we'll save that for another time. I think we've gone long enough. Um, Psalms 85, 12. It's beautiful. Now we, can we go into prayer then? Yep. You're uh, very sure. Psalm 85, I pray this over relationships. Uh, actually, 10. Excuse me. <laughs> Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. And so why don't we just go before our Heavenly Father. Father God, I thank you that you are the God of love, that you are our love, that your love is seated in us, and it awakens so many good things in us. It preserves us, and it also just drives us into more of you, Father, and your goodness. And it also brings awareness that causes us to see your goodness, Lord. I thank you, Father, for that. I pray that your love would 
be so real to each and every yes, one Lord. here in a whole brand new way. God, because you are a God of new beginnings, so I just call down from heaven fresh love here in Jesus' yep, name. Yep. On every head, fresh love, fresh awareness of you and your love, Father God, fresh acceptance of all you have for us and your love plan for us, and fresh appreciation, mm -hmm. Father God, of who you are and who we are. I thank you for how you made us, each and every one of us. In fact, can we just say that together? Thank you, God, for how you made me. Thank, Thank you, God, for how you made me. Thank you, God, that you have a love plan just for me. Thank you, God, that you have a love plan just for me. I thank you, Lord, for growing me up. Thank you, God, for growing me up. To be the responsible. To be the responsible. Supernatural. Supernatural. Amazing, amazing child of God, child of God that you've called me to be. That you've called me to be. So that I can have that magnificent match so that I can have that magnificent match that brings you God nothing but glory that brings you God nothing but glory thank you Jesus Father thank I just you, thank you you're all about filling us you're all about loving us and we just resign ourselves to be all about receiving of you God and your plan for our lives in Jesus name thank you Jesus mm -hmm. remember the husband loves the wife like what Church. Like what? Church. Is he waiting for a perfect person? What does Christ do in his love for the church? Starts with an F. Forgives. Yes. Mm -hmm. So every family, every spouse of the Jews, when there was marital contracts broken, God said, here's the remedy. Here's the remedy to repair that. It's love, compassion, forgiveness sourced in God, which is in your spirit. If the emotions are so frazzled and I'm so wounded, I just don't want to deal with it anymore. Then God says, I understand. I'm a father. You can cross that person off your life list and start over. Okay? So that's the beautiful thing about this. There is no loser. In fact, the Lord convicted me about saying what I said on Sunday about you know you going out and stealing pleasure. Make sure you as the man aren't stealing the girl's affections. Make sure that you're winning them. After further review, you stepped out of bounds, play comes back. If you're stealing affections, there's no lasting points and God doesn't bless disobedience. So you wanna win affections by saying, God, how far do you want me? And, and involve the Lord and then someone else that you can be accountable to. Your mother, your father, or your pastor, your uncle, some, or your aunt, or somebody. Somebody's watching you. And they want to help you. I want to help you. We're here. Others are here. And uh, God's going to really, really bless you.